So, um, while we're doing introductions, by the way, it's worth saying um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm in the Nova team at Red Hat, and uh, Red Hat has uh, an upstream first policy. Um, and Tristan is uh, uh, in the upstream, upstream security team. And uh, the first time, we've actually worked together on a, on a few different security bugs now, but uh, the, the first time uh, we worked together, we actually had no idea that we both worked for Red Hat. It's a complete coincidence. Um, one other meta, uh, meta point I'll say before we start is um, uh, I have noticed in a few talks that people like uh, photographing the slides. Absolutely, please feel free to, uh, to photograph the slides if you like, but these slides don't contain a massive amount of detail. The detail is in the speaker's notes, which I'm looking at over here, which you can't see. Um, if you would like um, uh, a full copy of the presentation, then uh, um, by all means, email myself or Tristan at the end, we'll send you a copy. Um, the other thing is, uh, at other conferences I've been to, there has been somewhere to upload slides to. Does anybody happen to know where we're supposed to upload slides to? No? You'll get a nagging email. Okay. I, I, uh, well, I, as soon as I get a nagging email, that would be fantastic. As soon as I find out where it is, I will, uh, I will upload the slides there. Uh, but I couldn't find it when I was looking at it before. Um, uh, and the other thing is, uh, the, the detail of this talk is really in, uh, in a couple of external URLs, uh, which we will give clearly uh, uh, on the board. So, um, uh, yeah, so you can go look at those. And the first one is this one, uh, which is nice and phone friendly for you. So. This talk is about the vulnerability management team process, which we're going to call the VMT process for short. And as I was saying before, everything in this talk could really be inferred from the documentation. Um, go, to that, go to that website. Um, it documents the whole process um, uh, really well. And all we're really going to do is, is talk through uh, a specific instance where we followed this process with a specific security bug. Um, and in doing that, we hope to add uh, a practical flavor to what is, by design, a very nice, boring, reliable process. We'd like to introduce you to some roles and responsibilities that you're going to encounter whilst going through that process and maybe introduce some design decisions that were involved in constructing the VMT process. So this presentation will talk about vulnerabilities. Um, a vulnerability, it's a weakness which allows an attacker to reduce a system information assurance. It's commonly referred to as a security bug or a CVE bug. And indeed, it's a special type of bug that needs extra attention because of its potential negative impact. So, vulnerability management, it's about assessing the impact and severity of a bug report. It's about designing security patch, following a process, and respect the rule of lesser disclosure. Lesser disclosure, it's about disclosing the vulnerability details to an increasing number of people over time but only to the people required to reach the next step. So we're going to be uh, using this diagram throughout the, uh, throughout the talk. And this is the VMT process. And you'll find the original version of this diagram on, uh, on the link I gave you earlier. Um, and, and this is exactly the same diagram, just reformatted slightly. Um, but to summarize, Way at the top, somebody reports a bug. And then we've got two streams. Over on the right, we've got um, what an engineer does. So an engineer works on a fix. Over on the left, uh, we've got what the VMT does. The VMT ensures everything is properly documented and coordinates with uh, all relevant parties. And then we get to embargo disclosure. So at embargo disclosure, we provide um, the fix early to certain critical users. And then we get to public disclosure, 
where we uh, we open the bug to uh, to everybody and uh, and the fixes are released. So, why do we follow this process now? you are very obviously not legally obliged to follow this process. The process is designed to serve the community. So we've got a couple of interests here. The disclosure of unpa unpatched vulnerabilities is not in the community's best interests. But at the same time, it's not in the best interest of the community to keep known vulnerabilities secret for a long time because they tend to leak. So the process is designed to enable you to disclose uh, your vulnerability as quickly as is responsibly possible. And the reason we follow it is because we're good citizens. There's no stick. The process is designed to help you make those responsible disclosure uh, decisions. And Tristan earlier referred to uh, lesser disclosure. The first step uh, in that disclosure was when uh, you reported the bug to the VMT. And after that, the VMT will guide you through um, further disclosures until the bug is released. For this talk, I will be talking about everything done by the Vulnerability Management Team, or VMT, and Mark, Matt will be uh, talking about everything that is done by Red Hat Engineering. But you should know that it's not a two-man show, and uh, we are going to talk on behalf of uh, many other users, part of those. Uh... So, step one, uh, discovering the bug. So the bug was originally reported by me on the 22nd of February 2016. Uh, and it was just from code inspection. So I was working on something else and, uh, and I noticed something that didn't quite look right um, and, uh, and I decided to, to look into it a little bit close, uh, closer. And specifically, I noticed that Nova would do format inspection on a disk if a certain metadata file was missing. And I also knew that there was a way that a user could engineer that metadata file to be missing, specifically by doing a resize operation and a couple of other ways. So for anybody who's not familiar with it, a format ins uh, inspection. So KVM, which is the, uh, the hypervisor which is most used by Nova's libvirt driver, and I think the most used hypervisor in OpenStack. It can store data on disk in a number of different formats. But Nova uses raw and QCOW2. A raw file is exactly what it sounds like. So if we're storing uh, information on the file system, what we've got is a file, and it contains the exact bits that a user wrote to their virtual disk. If we're using QCOW2, then QCOW2 has some additional features. Um, and those additional features are described by a header, which goes at the start of the file. And one of the additional features QCOW2 provides us is backing files. And backing files allow that QCOW2 to say, this disk refers to this other file on the host compute. And Nova uses them for base images. So when we've got uh, a, a glance image and, uh, and we're using that as a template for a number of different guests, then we've got, uh, we've got a, uh, a base image over here and then we've got a QCOW2 which says, this disk is everything that's in that template over there plus some changes. <coughs> and they're really useful. Now, Nova file system storage uses QCOW2 by default, but you can also configure it to use raw. Now, remember that a raw file is whatever the user wrote to their disk. So the, the user, if you're using raw on a file system, can control completely what's in that file. And that's OK as long as we know it's raw. But if we can force it 
to do format inspection, then the user has an opportunity to do something underhand. If the user writes to their, to their raw-backed file a fake QCOW2 header, and then engineers it so that we're going to have to inspect that to work out what's in that file, then when we inspect it, if the user has written a fake QCOW2 header, then we're going to inspect it and we're going to think it's QCOW2. And if the malicious user writes a fake QCOW2 header that says, this disk refers to this other file on the host, then when they start their instance up, they're not going to see their own data. They're going to see that other file on the host. And even worse than that, uh, if they say, this other file on the host is the compute's root disk, then we can see everything on the compute host, including the, uh, the data of other users and other tenants. So with that in mind, uh, the bug I thought I, could, I saw was that a user could create an instance with an ephemeral disk, and they could write a fake QCOW2 header to that disk and say, this, this disk refers to this other file, which I'm guessing is present on the host. And then they do a resize operation, which causes that metadata file to get deleted or to go missing. And then they restart, and then they can see whatever was on the host. And when I initially saw that, I actually I thought it would be um, mitigated by SE Linux. But and we'll touch on a little bit later. It turned out I was wrong, and it is not. Um, and more generally, we're looking into that. So I think I found a bug. What do I do? Now, um, as you probably know, uh, bugs uh, in Nova are quite exceptionally rare. So the chances are that nobody in the room uh, has ever encountered the Nova bug reporting system. But if you had, then you would know that we use Launchpad. Um, and security bugs go in exactly the same place. So we go to um, uh, the security bug reporting process is exactly the same as reporting any other bug right up to the last step. So we, uh, uh, we go to Launchpad. We add a summary. We add uh, some further information. Uh, and then we scroll down to the bottom of that long blurb. Has anybody ever read that? Not me. Uh, and we see uh, the bit at the bottom that says, this contains information that is public, with a little pencil next to it. And if we expand that, then we can see this is where our, uh, our visibility options are. And the one we want to choose is private security. And if we do that, then it gives us a, uh, a nice reassuring bar at the top. Uh, which um, tells us that when we click Submit, we're not going to be making it public. And when you do that, as a member of the vulnerability management team, I am notified of a new bug report against OpenStack project. And the first task for uh, the VMT will be to confirm whenever the report describes a vulnerability or not. To do that, I subscribe the project liaison in this case, it will be the Nova Corsec. And we engage the discussion to check uh, if it's considered as a vulnerability. Because most of the time, new bug reports turns out to be benign. So it's, it's better to be safe than sorry. The VMT is using a taxonomy to rank bug reports. Only the bug that can be fixed in the master version and all stable release will be handled by the VMT. We call them class A. Class B will indicate the bug that can't be fully fixed, such as one affecting a poor architecture or bad designs. Those are handled by a security note instead of an advisory. Class C reports indicate one that are not really practical. For example, when it depends on guessing a random value, such as a UUID, then we don't consider it as a practical vulnerability, and it does not deserve an advisory. And of course, we have extra classes for bugs only affecting the development branch, like that have not been released yet, 
security hardening opportunities when the sec default settings are um, not bad but not great either, and regular bug that sometimes got reported as a security bug for some reason. In this case, Mathieu clearly described the bug in the report, and thus it was easy to confirm. At that point, the VMT coordinator will start writing an impact description that will be communicated to downstream stakeholders, and it will also serve as a basis for the upcoming advisory. So it's important to get it at the very beginning. The purpose is to describe the impact from a stakeholder point of view. Indeed, technical quirks from the report uh, are not necessarily, uh, does not necessarily matter, and it needs to be converted into um, format that articulate with the actor, for example, is it remote or is it an authenticated user, with the action triggering the bug, what is the impact and what are the consequences, and finally, which deployments are actually affected, and does it need a special options or something non-default. Lastly, the impact description will also include reporter credits, as well as the affected version that needs to be narrowed down. So, uh, to answer Tristan's questions, the bug in this case uh, can be exploited by a remote authenticated user. The bug is triggered when the user does a resize operation. The impact is read-only access to all storage connected to the compute host, including the data of other users. And it only affects deployments which use raw file system storage, which fortunately is not the default. But to help answer these questions with certainty, um, I didn't do that myself. Um, uh, I pulled in some, uh, some colleagues for uh, additional input and a reproducer. And this presents as an immediate problem because we do all of our disclosure management through Launchpad, through the bug, to centralize it. And by default, the bug is visible only to me and to the VMT. So I can point my colleagues to it, but they can't see it. So uh, as the bug reporter, I can open it to whoever I want, uh, which is what I did. Um, so uh, here's the bug, and this is Launchpad. And to open it up to, uh, to a new person, if you have a look in very small up at the top right, you'll see other bug subscribers and a link saying, subscribe someone else. That is the bit you're looking for. So you click subscribe somebody else and, uh, and that person is added. So in the first instance, I added my colleague Dan Beranger, uh, who looked at the bug and he pointed out uh, that SE Linux was not going to be the defense that I thought it was going to be, which was confirmed by my colleague Lee Yarwood, who actually, um, uh, set up the issue, uh, um, uh, set up a system to reproduce it properly and confirmed that we could actually uh, exploit the host in the way described. But note that at this point in the process, I still haven't opened up the bug to, uh, to many people or, or in fact even my own team. So, with a better understanding of the severity of the bug, prompted by uh, Tristan's questions. Uh, Lee then started working on it immediately uh, because we realized it was quite severe. Uh, this presents us with some practical problems though because we can't use public infrastructure as that would disclose the bug. Um, so specifically, we can't use upstream Gerrit and we can't use upstream CI. And the same goes for the unpacked description. Um, after uh, having produced a draft and having it validated by Mathieu, uh, we also go uh, only on the launch pad where all the information are gathered at a single point of uh, coordination. And um, another VMT coordinator will review and double check every details to make sure it's accurate and uh, there is no grammar error and stuff like that. 
Then comes the review process. Now, I, I said we can't use Gerrit, but um, uh, we still have to go through a review pro process, but obviously it's slightly um, complicated. So what we do instead is we still develop patches, uh, but instead of posting them to Garrett, we post them, we format them as diff files and post them to the, uh, uh, to the, to the launch pad. And then we get other people who are also subscribed to the bug to, to review them on there. Something else we need to think about at this stage is that uh, when the bug eventually does become public, when it eventually is going to go to Garrett, it is still going to have to go through the same review process that every other patch uh, to Nova goes through. But because of the severity of the, of the impact of the bug, we want it to, to clear that hurdle very quickly. So a good idea uh, is at this stage to get a core reviewer on board um, to, uh, uh, to give a provisional plus two. So what I did was uh, I added uh, Dan Smith to, uh, to the bug and he reviewed it. And we had a little bit of back and forth on that with Dan. Um, and when he said he was uh, provisionally happy, um, we, uh, we uh, decided we were good to go. Well, it's actually uh, not a good thing to do. It's uh, mandatory for the VMT to have uh, approval on the launchpad uh, bug report because uh, otherwise um, there is no guarantee it will get uh, merged uh, once public. To ensure the full traceability, we have a CVU number assigned before the issue is communicated to a larger public. So we use the, the common vulnerability uh, and exposure, in short CVE number, which is a system that provides a reference-based method for known vulnerability. And once the patch and the impact description are approved, um, the VMT coordinator will request a CVA number to uh, uh, something called a CNA. Uh, it's the CVA number authority. Um, for public issue, we request the Mitre Corporation and um, because they handle all the public uh, vulnerabilities. And for private issue, we are uh, going to request them for, um, from uh, the Red Hat CNA, which is the, um, uh, the historical uh, one that does uh, Linux vulnerabilities number assignment. So once we receive the number, uh, it gets attached to the bug report. So that, again, it's the single point of coordination for uh, OpenStack issues. And uh, we now have everything to um, move on to the next step. So when the issue is um, still private, we may do an embargo disclosure. Otherwise, we jump directly to publishing the advisory at that point. Um, in the spirit of uh, responsible disclosure, the ecosystem, collectively known as uh, downstream stakeholders, uh, needs to be warned in advance so that they can roll out patch in a coordinated fashion on disclosure day. The first step is then to propose a disclosure day. Uh, we use a very short embargo period, which is uh, from three to five days, excluding Mondays and Friday. So it can go, uh, it can be very short. So as the, as the bug reporter, the, the VMT actually asks me when, when I want to disclose, because it's my bug. But they will help me pick. Uh, and as I said before, we've got these um, uh, competing um, uh, desires in the process. So we want to disclose um, as quickly as possible to, uh, to minimize the risk of, leak, risk of leaks, whilst giving ourselves enough time to complete the process. So, on this occasion, I, uh, I took advice from both uh, the VMT and Red Hat's internal security team. Uh, and this time, it was fairly simple to, to pick a date. It was as soon as we were done, plus a couple of days. However, it's not always quite that simple. So, for example, there was a previous CV that we worked on um, at the end of last year. And uh, the, the initial uh, disclosure date that I proposed, I, I think it was the 22nd of December. And, uh, and the, I, I proposed this, and the VMT uh, gave me a prod and said, perhaps that might not be terribly nice to a bunch of sysadmins. So uh, maybe, maybe you could move that by, uh, by a couple of weeks. So we moved that to just after uh, the new year. But it was still my call. And once uh, this is agreed upon, 
and I'm in charge of sending the pre-OSAC, which is uh, the advanced notification document, which includes basically the impact description, the CV number, the pre-approved patch, and the disclosure date, so that uh, everyone is on board with the same uh, bits of information. So as Red Hat uh, is an OpenStack distributor, we have uh, customers that are running this stuff in, uh, in production. Um, we are um, actually one of the, the, the people on that embargo disclosure list. Um, we'll aim to, to have a fix ready for our customers along with everybody else who's in a similar situation, uh, ready to go when the, uh, when the bu bug becomes uh, public. Um, and we firewall ourselves internally on this. So uh, the Red Hat, we disclose to ourselves internally at exactly the same time as we disclose to everybody else. So um, our, our, our internal infrastructure team, even though uh, on this occasion the bug came from uh, inside Red Hat, um, we didn't have a head start on anybody else. So on this embargo disclosure date, um, we uh, um, we're then good to, to go to start the process of, uh, of getting this out to our customers. So when Lee originally developed the patch, um, he developed it against um, Upstream, and then he backported it to the, uh, to the supported Upstream stable branches. And then he further backported the, uh, um, the, the patch to all supported uh, Red Hat releases. And at this embargo disclosure date, he can then push those uh, backported patches into our downstream Gerrit, which allows us to, uh, to review them formally within the team, and then push them out to our build infrastructure and into our own CI. And uh, once we've done that, once we've got builds ready, once we've QA'd them, we then need to uh, prepare an internal erratum. We need to package this stu uh, stuff up so we can give it out to our customers. And we have to do all of this in a three to five day window. So as soon as we push go on the embargo disclosure, uh, Red Hat release engineering is very, very busy, as I expect are uh, a number of other release engineering teams. On this closure day, uh, I opened the bug report and coordinate with a Nova developer to submit the patch to Gerrit, just in case the, the patch does not apply because the master may have changed uh, um, during the embargo period. Um, we also be um, um, very wary of, of test results uh, by the um, upstream CI system. Because if the gate is failing and the patch needs uh, alteration, because uh, there was a regression or uh, unnoticed uh, side effect, we have to quickly um, contact the stakeholders to tell them that the patch needs to be modified. And um, if this happens after the patch has been merged and the advisory send out, uh, we also need to take care about uh, the fact uh, it's missing something or it needs to be changed. So we call this uh, an errata. So at this point, uh, Lee pushed the, uh, the fix to upstream master and, uh, and to the supported stable branches. And, uh, and we started the, the regular review process. Uh, and in this case, uh, it turns out that we had actually introduced a regression, which is unfortunate, uh, as it wasn't caught in review. So uh, we very quickly developed uh, a fix for that, and we pushed that out in, uh, in, in a day or so, I think. It was uh, expedited. And as Tristan mentioned, he then had to go back to the, uh, um, uh, to the OSSA and update it with an erratum to say, and there was an additional fix. So once the patch looks good on the um, Gerrit system and that core developer have approved or at least tests are succeeding, um, we proceed to produce the final advisory document. So one should know that uh, we are using um, also code review to uh, validate uh, the document with a peer review. And uh, it's based on the YAML uh, description of um, all the details that we have been presenting so far. And 
plus the bug report uh, URL and the patch number that uh, we didn't have until we opened the bug. Um, so when this review is approved, the website uh, security.openstack.org get updated with the latest information. And uh, it also renders a nice restructured text uh, output that we can uh, send to a couple of mailing lists, such as the OpenStack uh, um, open source security mailing list, as well as the OpenStack annonce, so that uh, when it's public, it's really public. So, the timeline of this bug. It was originally reported by me on uh, the 22nd of February, 2016. And we released the fix on the 9th of March, 2016. So that was uh, pretty quick. And we did this during the Metaka cycle. Uh, we also backported it to Upstream, Kilo, and Liberty, which were the, uh, the uh, supported Upstream stable branches at the, uh, at the time. Which is uh, a key point, by the way, because um, uh, there are no branches, there are no other stable branches uh, to backport to. So is, is anybody in the room still running Juno? No? Good. Because if you were, then, uh, then, then that would still be vulnerable. Um, but uh, uh, distributors, obviously, including Red Hat, we, um, uh, we support um, much older releases than that. So uh, I, we backported this to OSP 5, certainly, and possibly even OSP 4, I can't remember. Uh, but that would be uh, at least Icehouse. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you're, if you're running upstream stable, it is important to stay on top of uh, 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 patches. Otherwise, you're going to be, uh, t to be vulnerable to these things. And at this point, the bug is now open. So uh, uh, we gave the URL earlier. You can go and have a look at that. Uh, and you can read all the comments, including everything that was embargoed at the time. You can see the, uh, the patch review process and everything. And at this point, you are, of course, also expected to create a logo for your security vulnerability and to publish it on a website and to create a GitHub repo uh, where, you can, uh, where you can share things about it. Oh, here are a couple of other examples that illustrates uh, the VMT process pretty well. The, the first one was uh, involved a tricky 10 steps uh, exploitation process that uh, got a long time to figure uh, out and uh, lots of iteration to fix properly. And the second one was a, a critical network bug that was uh, handled swiftly across all stable branch in, uh, I think, about two weeks it was. Uh, so that was a great example. However, things does not uh, work out uh, that well all the time. Uh, in particular, the process may fail when, uh, uh, well, for example, a stakeholder that does not uh, understand the embargo, the list, and push uh, the patch uh, to get it uh, before the disclosure day, or when the bug report simply gets uh, opened uh, by accident. So sometimes it's happened. So the the short version of that uh, uh, talk about um, what happens when uh, there is a security issue could be summarized like, uh, so we need to create a bug uh, and check the private uh, security option if it's uh, relevant. Then the VMT will add an advisory task to the bug. So if it's not vulnerable, it's, all, it's fine. The task will be closed and uh, we move on. And uh, otherwise the process, uh, the real process starts. So there is a discussion and patch development that happens on the bug report. Um, there, is, there will be a CV number assigned. Uh, stakeholder will be notified in advance. Uh, the report is then disclosed and the issue is fixed as well as the OSA is published. And I think that's it. Do you have questions? So Can I, I ask think you, you to grab the microphone? Just oh, over there. Not. Thank you. They're recording. They won't be able to hear you if you don't use the microphone. Yeah. So just quick comment on that, actually. Um, the CVE number triggers a one clock kind of running as well, because as soon as it's assigned, that information that which project it's assigned to gets public, even the details don't. So from Metro, you can go now and, and look CVEs that has been assigned but has not been, uh, the information has not been released yet. 
That's so it. that's that's something like if you are a Nova admin, for example, it's a good idea to scan through and basically add those CVEs on your follow list. So when the information becomes public, you get that information right away. No. Well, that depends because, uh, first of all, the, the process is changing actually, and Mitre is uh, providing uh, ways to request CV number uh, privately because uh, it used to be through uh, a mailing list. So, indeed, uh, it was public, and that's why uh, the OpenStack is relying on uh, another CNA for uh, private issues. And um, turns out, uh, um, as much as uh, for um, embargo bug, uh, Red Hat engineer won't use uh, um, the Red Hat uh, internal system. Uh, the security team that assigns number for uh, external project will do the same. Like Nova developer won't be uh, aware of a CV request until uh, we go down to the uh, uh, embargo disclosure. So requesting a CV does not necessarily expose uh, that much of uh, a new vulnerability. If that was the question. Yeah. No, it, it tells that for it. It, I can repeat yeah, if you want. Sorry, it, it tells that there is a CVE requested for Nova, for ah, example. I'm not so sure about that. I think the, the, regi the registry are, uh, are not uh, necessarily public. Uh, the registry will just show it's assigned to Red Hat Block because they're handling the OSS. Yes, the CNA are like a blog, like a, it's a register a bit, so you don't know what have been registered. I thought it was the opposite, actually. The Meet website used to not update their web page uh, as soon as the disclosure happened, so you wouldn't even know uh, the affected project. Go ahead. So I'll just follow up on the CVE stuff. I can guarantee you now there is at least one vulnerability in every single OpenStack service that exists today, whether or not there's a waiting CVE for it, so I don't think it really creates a problem with exposure. My actual question is slightly different. So what happens when you have a vulnerability reported and you acknowledge that it is a security defect, but let's say it's a design issue or something like that, something you can't easily change or, or backport. So, well, again, uh, the VMT will only uh, take care of a class A type of bug. So uh, when it's uh, not something we can fix, we won't request ourselves a CV. Uh, however, um, we, uh, for those kind of bugs, we uh, add, uh, suggest a security note that will be written then by the security project. And uh, one should know that anyone can actually request a CV. It's not uh, something we have a privilege of. It's just that uh, we happen to do it for uh, uh, coordination and purpose. I guess in that case, we'd be looking to make sure everybody knows what the vulnerability is and can at least know that they're vulnerable to it and mitigate it if possible. Go ahead. So given the size of the project, have you tried to become yourself a CNE? Uh, that have been uh, in discussion, actually, but uh, not, uh, it's not that worthy, because uh, we don't issue that many uh, advisory in the end. Mm, OK. Victor. What is your opinion of embargo? Is it something uh, useful? Is it something good? Or do you want to just get rid of embargo and just publish everything uh, to, to get more people reviewing the patch and maybe uh, get more attention on, on vulnerability and security? So um, from, from a practical engineering point of view, as a, as a red hatter with customers, uh, I do actually appreciate the three-day window uh, to try and uh, get a, a fix in the hands of people who are running this, who, who might be vulnerable at the same time that it becomes public. It's, uh, it, it, it's a tough one. It's probably a philosophical question. Um, but uh, uh, I, think, um, I think it's probably um, uh, does the most good to the most users. Um, to uh, um, yeah, to get that out there, and I mean, uh, Red Hat is not the only entity that gets this information early. I mean, public clouds would would also be on that list. Uh, other all, all the distributors. So anybody who who can can justify 
uh, themselves as being a source of real fixes for real users in the wild is going to, uh, is going to be on that list. Um, pragmatically, I think embargo is a good thing, but we need to keep it short. Yeah, what matters is really the period. Okay, thank you. Like more than a month, it, uh, it goes more harm than, uh, yeah. than benefits. You're going to have to be quick, Aaron, because uh, we've just gone over time. Okay, so in this particular case, the actual discovery was driven by developers' curiosity and diligence and so on. So I'm wondering, do we ever see cases where these exploits are actually used in the wild? Is that a thing in OpenStack? Well, with, uh, to, our, to our knowledge. I am uh, only... Um, as a vulnerability management team member, we only uh, discuss about uh, bug reports on, uh, and there is uh, no case of uh, in the wide exploitation. So, so interesting. I guess that would be more of a question for ops. Does it, has anybody ever seen their cloud being exploited? There are Metasploit modules. Really? Cool. <coughs> should go check that out. Right, uh, at that point, I think we're going to have to wrap up. So, um, yeah, if you'd like to contact uh, myself or Tristan, um, details are there. Um, uh, the helpful gentleman over there said that uh, I'll get a NAG email to upload the slides somewhere at some point, which, uh, which I will do. Uh, if that doesn't happen, as I say, feel free to email uh, myself and Tristan and we'll send you a copy of the presentation that has all the speakers' notes in it. Thank you very much.